Hello and welcome. This is the breakout session on uh, quantum mechanics and all nuclear reactions. And I'm delighted to announce the first speaker is Dr. Florian Metzler from MIT. And he is talking on nuclear excitation transfer at low energy levels. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, it's my pleasure uh, to present on nuclear excitation transfer or what could also be referred to as uh, resonant um, energy transfer between nuclei. But before I get into the weeds, let me uh, provide a bit of context. So we're uh, a group centered at MIT, but also loosely connected with a, a large number of collaborators, uh, quite interdisciplinary. And one of our goals really is to facilitate converse, uh, conversations and discussions around concepts that may be really high impact, but that, that may, uh, for one reason or another, uh, not be at the forefront of, uh, of a lot of conversations uh, to date. And, and so one of the, the key topics that uh, we, we think fits into that bucket, and what especially uh, Peter Hagelstein has worked on for many years, is the question of what tools might be available to modify nuclear reaction parameters in, in small scale configurations, so rather than through large uh, particle accelerators. Or um, Julian Schwinger expressed a similar idea in, 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 in uh, some uh, different words. One must ask if any conceivable mechanism now exists or might be devised whereby nuclear energy could be extracted by manipulations at the atomic level. And so um, we believe that um, resonance energy transfer um, between nuclei may be a mechanism that, that would fit that bill. And uh, that's kind of an overview slide. Um, the idea is that nuclear excitation is sought to be transferred non-radiatively uh, across nuclei via low energy couplings. And let me um, deconstruct that a little bit. So uh, imagine a, a, a sample consisting um, of a single crystal iron 57 structure with some uh, cobalt 57 dopants that are, that are radioactive and decay uh, to populate um, an uh, uh, iron 57 excited state. Um, and uh, after initial uh, uh, relaxation to the 14 kV state, you would expect, uh, uh, and we, we ignore the 122 emission for now, we, uh, you would expect a 14 kV uh, photon emission from, from such a sample, and, and uh, you would expect a continuous replenishment of, of that kind of process through the decay of the cobalt-57 nuclei. Um, and now um, consider if such a sample were to be coherently stimulated, for instance, with a laser. Um, and uh, uh, you get all kinds of uh, uh, dynamics in your sample. And uh, now if that same process happens of the population of the 14 kV states, um, one could conceive of um, a transfer reaction that happens here where the 14 kV non-radiatively transfers to another nearby nucleus that is, uh, of course, resonant because they're all uh, iron 57 um, in the sample. And, um, and that would then subsequently decay. Um, and so you would uh, expect from a system like this in sort of the, in the first approximation, all kinds of uh, interesting dynamics. Um, and to build a little bit more intuition, so here's a simple um, mechanical uh, or analog um, where um, you see uh, two coupled oscillators with a, with a, with a uh, coupling spring. Um, and th this coupling in between them, it's interesting, these dynamics, of course, persist even if the coupling is weak and even if and also the 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 carrying capacity of the coupling so this this the spring here if you will it doesn't need to um, be able to accommodate the the uh, energy that's being transferred so those are just important points to keep in mind um, and that are I think nicely illustrated with the with the uh, mechanical um, the classical analog um, of course this kind of resonance energy transfer is is commonly uh, used and studied at the atomic and, and molecular level. So we've actually seen this, this uh, graph before at the conference of a uh, chain of Rydberg, Rydberg atoms where the couplings between them are tuned and energy uh, is, uh, is quite deliberately moved around. Um, and another uh, famous case is from photosynthesis where um, you have non-radiative energy transfer between these chromophore molecules uh, after initially being excited by by sunlight um, uh, moving uh, towards the reaction center. And here also, um, I think this sets us up nicely for a discussion of some of the uh, mechanisms and potential concerns is that um, here in, in this picture, you have unexpectedly large transfer rates. So this is reflected in the high internal 
quantum efficiency and photosynthesis. So, so simple models would not expect the, the, to have that high performance, that high efficiency of the transfer process. And so that's led researchers to study why, why that is. And, and uh, uh, we believe that the, um, the mechanisms that enhance this kind of transfer that have been identified this way are actually uh, are also relevant at the nuclear scale to address some concerns that one might have about nuclear excitation transfer this way. And um, uh, so one concern could be for indirect transfer, doesn't destructive interference cause transfer rates to be low? And the response would be, um, yes, in a, in a naive picture, yes. But in the real world um, system, you have, uh, for instance, dephasing effects. And, and uh, this paper by Plenio and Huelga actually shows nicely that in the presence of this kind of dephasing or loss, you actually get higher transfer rates because of it rather than um, the lower transfer rates. And that, that is because the some of the destructive interference is, is being broken, uh, mitigated this way. Another uh, concern that one might have is that the transfer rate might still be too low despite these kind of dephasing effects. Um, and uh, then one may also refer to like super radiance type of enhancement, like what uh, in some papers is called super transfer. So there's a, a, a nice paper here that shows the expected enhancement of the exocon diffusion in the chain of chromophores um, as a function of the number of participating systems. So you also get this kind of transfer rate increase um, as a result of, of super transfer or super radiance type enhancements. And then a, a, a final concern one might voice is, uh, aren't the couplings still too weak, the canonical couplings between nuclei in the, that are typically expected to be in the nano electron uh, volt range or below? Um, and here I refer to the work of, of Peter Hagelstein, who's worked on this for many years, and here's just two papers that, that show some uh, summaries of, of, of his results um, that suggest that there are, in fact, couplings that are less um, widely known, but um, that, uh, that, that exhibit uh, coupling strengths that are significantly higher um, in the hundreds of nano electron volts and, and, and above. Um, so that's, uh, so, so there are a number of reasons, a number of mechanisms to believe that, that this kind of nuclear excitation transfer may, may indeed be possible. Um, uh, here, I, I refer to some of the modeling work also by Peter Hagelstein, starting with, um, with very comprehensive models um, of lattice dynamics across nuclear and, and atomic levels. Here's also the phono nuclear coupling uh, uh, highlighted, um, and then a reduced version of such a model that focuses on particular phonon modes and particular nuclear states, um, uh, which then uh, uh, becomes a, a spin boson type, type of model um, to work with. Um, from, from these models, one can derive transfer uh, rate estimates, and, and this is very much work in progress, but just to give you a sense, uh, in, in this rate expression, for instance, we can see that the, the transfer rate scales with the system size. And so, um, Based on the work to date, we, uh, we do believe it's, it's possible to get transfer rates that are several orders of magnitude uh, faster than the, than the spontaneous emission, than the, than the lifetime of, of the states. And, and if that is indeed the case, you could conceive of observables or of, of experiments um, um, uh, that, uh, that look for uh, observables um, uh, of the sort of a nature that's similar to exciton diffusion. If you do, in fact, get um, orders of magnitude faster transfer rates, then you can have you can fit many transfer steps within the lifetime of say the 14 kV state. And if you if you're reaching um, microns or hundreds of microns even of of, of, of a diffusion range, a diffusion length, then um, that would uh, be something that could be observable in in a, in a setup like this. And I should mention here. The sample is slightly different from what I showed earlier. Here, you would have a, a sample with two regions, one with just iron-57 nuclei and one with um, uh, uh, the same crystal, but, but with a, a heavy doping of cobalt-57. And so again, with stimulation, you would expect to draw out some of the excitation, get the emission from a region of the sample that, that usually wouldn't, that wouldn't normally ex, uh, expect to, to show any emission without the, the coherent stimulation. And uh, uh, so this would be, this requires fairly strong couplings though. So we, we don't know um, uh, under what conditions that, that, could, that could be achieved, but uh, actually a more sensitive type of experiment that would uh, show uh, significant effects with weaker couplings would be um, to um, shoot for collective emission. So 
imagine a, a sample, again, a single crystal sample. Here we just consider one cobalt-57 uh, uh, nucleus, and uh, the nucleus decays while the sample is currently stimulated, and um, there's a, a superposition state where the um, excitation through, through weak couplings is shared with other nuclei, nuclei nearby, and then the uh, emission is a, is, a, is a collective emission. So the, the, the emitted photon kind of interferes with itself. And, it, and uh, my colleague Nicola Galvanetto has done some wonderful mo uh, modeling and simulation work to, to actually show that this, this kind of effect would show within the, the parameters of, of uh, you know, reasonably sized uh, samples and distances and so forth. So, so this is the expected interference pattern he obtains from uh, 100,000 uh, decay events of that. Of that nature. So, um, so to, just to summarize so far, so we, we think um, non-radiative nuclear excitation transfer may, may indeed be possible, uh, especially uh, well, it would require the kind of enhancement, some of the known and some of the newer enhancement um, mechanisms that, that, uh, that, are, that are known and that have been discussed. Um, the key point is the couplings between nuclei, um, and uh, we, we uh, proposed some simple experiments that could be used as a platform for studying such couplings and also the, the um, uh, mechanisms to tune them. And the ultimate goal would really be to have some sort of, uh, to enable some sort of trans transition rate engineering for nuclei as a, as a new a tool in the toolbox of nuclear engineering. So and you could imagine this, had, this could have far-reaching implications for things like nuclear power production, nuclear uh, waste treatment. But um, this could also um, help explain some of the anomalies that um, have been reported in the, in the, uh, at the intersection of, um, of, of nuclear um, physics and, and condensed matter physics. So uh, uh, I'm referring here to three papers in particular where you have in each case a similar experimental setup of a very low energy uh, uh, proton or deuterium uh, a deuteron beam uh, impinging on a metal target, uh, and uh, and you'd have in this case this work from the Naval Research Laboratories. You have a, a, a bur you had a burst of twenty one MeV charged particles. This is work that uh, we did at MIT that a colleague of mine led, uh, Sadie Forbes, where there was a burst of twenty eight MeV charged particles in a similar setup, and and this is a California based company that reported a burst of around eight nine MeV charged particles from a similar setup. And just to give you a bit more context, you wouldn't expect to see anything from, um, from such a low, from such a low, less than 0.5 kV beam. So um, this is um, a work that uh, is done by a group in Berlin, just to, to show that similar setup as a regular neutron generator, basically. You have an 8 kV uh, a proton or deuteron beam, in this case a deuteron beam. And so they would, uh, they, that's the, the resulting charged particle spectrum you'd expect. So, so you'd uh, get charged particles at 3 MeV or below, and you sm fairly uh, uh, small numbers uh, commensurate to, the, to the, the low cross section. But then if you go even lower be beyond 1 keV, the, the, the cross section from the nuclear database is becomes, the, which is extrapolated, it becomes so low you wouldn't expect to see anything. So yeah, you wouldn't expect to see any charged particles and certainly not above the 3 MeV. And so, that, so that's kind of what makes these results anomalous or these, these reports. Um, and so how does, how, how does charged particle production or, or fusion possibly relate to this idea of nuclear excitation transfer? So here we're bringing Julian Schwinger back in who proposed to frame uh, nuclear fusion as a, a nuclear state transition problem rather than a, a two-body collision problem where, where you view a, um, a deuterium molecule as a, as a, a four-nucleon configuration that's highly clustered that wants to relax down into a more compact four-nucleon configuration. So a nuclear state transition with a really um, a long uh, half-life. And so we can use the uh, Kunin and Nauenberg uh, estimate from a nature paper um, that, that as the mean fusion rate for a deuterium molecule as the, as the half-life of that state, 10 to the minus 64 per second. And now if we... and uh, uh, Rob has talked uh, about these screening effects. Now, if we, if, we, if we have a more accurate picture of a lattice surrounding this deuterium molecule, you have these screening effects, and we, we can expect another 20 orders of magnitude enhancement. So that's still a low rate, but that puts us into the sort of 10 to the uh, minus 40 um, ballpark. And, 
And now consider um, you have coherent stimulation of such a kind of sample, and you, 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 you create a significant couplings where the, this uh, deuterium to helium-4 transition is resonant with an excitation of a nearby a coupled, coupled lattice nucleus. And so a lot of the heavy nuclei have these um, high-density rotational uh, bands in this region. And so you, it's quite conceivable that there are nuclei in the sample uh, that are resonant with this 24 MeV uh, transition. And, and especially in our experiment at MIT, we had a tungsten filament for the ion accelerator. So it's very likely to have tungsten implanted in the sample. And so, um, so, so then you could conceive that nuclear excitation transfer does lead to an acceleration um, of, that, um, of that nuclear state transition, i.e. The, the fusion reaction. And actually, uh, uh, Peter Hagelstein has done some, some concrete model, modeling of that situation, and he uh, expects us uh, more than 30 orders uh, of magnitude as a potential uh, uh, enhancement. Um, that could be expected from such a setup. And so here's the, the um, experimental setup of that um, accelerator, the low energy accelerator at MIT uh, with the uh, titanium sample, uh, which again, we expect to have some tungsten implanted and, and that gave us these, um, uh, this burst of uh, 28 MeV charged particles. And so, so we think that may be, um, uh, may be pointing the way at some of the uh, potential of of nuclear excitation transfer, providing motivation to further study and further model and, and, and develop the experiments around that. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions. And if we, there's no time for enough discussion, then please reach out to me and we can discuss further.